1 to 11. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So you can uh, look that up now. And Joe Turner is uh, going to read that for us. This reading today is from Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, and thanks, Sam, for, for leading us. And uh, good morning. So as Sam mentioned, we're thinking about um, the second E in our five E's, um, evangelism, um, this morning. And actually, with all that's been going on around us, it's been good for us to, to think last week about what it means for us as, as Christians to be seeking to engage the community with love, to, to seek to meet the needs that there are around. And it's good for us this morning, in the midst of this crazy pandemic, to think about how we can share the hope that we have, the, the hope that we have, which is infinitely greater than anything else this world can offer. Now, I don't know about you when you, at the start of a talk about evangelism, or you know evangelism is going to be spoken of, sometimes it can just throw up feelings of uh, guilt and fear and inadequacy, all, all of those things. My, my prayer as I've been preparing for this and, and thinking about it is, is that this time together would be encouraging for us, uh, that, that we would take great encouragement from what Jesus says here to his very confused disciples. Um, so um, let's pray. Let's ask for God's help as we look at that passage in, in Acts 1 and think about what it means for us today. So let's pray. Some words from a song that I've been listening to. Uh, Lean on the everlasting arms of God. He lavishes grace as our burdens grow greater. He sends us more strength as our labours increase. To added afflictions, he offers more mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary that's known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. So lean hard, lean hard, lean on the everlasting arms. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to do that, to lean hard on your everlasting arms. Thank you for uh, that your arms are everlasting. Thank you that your love has no limits, your grace has no measure. And we pray that as we look at your word this morning, you would um, open it up to us. We pray that you would encourage us. We pray that you would... Take away any misconceptions that we might have about 
uh, mission, evangelism. And we pray that you would encourage us and inspire us to hold out this great hope that we have in the Lord Jesus. So would you magnify him? Would he take all the glory and would you uh, help us and mould us into your image as we look at your word? Amen. Well, I'm going to ask Sam to put uh, a, a rather iconic image up on the screen. Here we are, 007, James Bond. Uh, what do you make of that guy? Now, I'm under no illusions that... Uh, I am in any way suave, sophisticated, cool. People tell me I look more like Mr. Bean than Mr. Bond. I think you should strike the same pose. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so well, what do you make of James Bond? He's got the gadgets, the cars, the wit, the mastery of Kung Fu and modern languages. He is a legend to some people. To others... Well, he's a bit of a misogynistic womaniser, isn't he? A, a relic of the Cold War era. Regardless of what you think of James Bond, you've, you've got to agree that he gets the job done. And I think that it's fair to say that when it comes to his missions, he is always fully briefed, fully equipped and fully supported. M will always give him a full rundown of what Spectre or the Russians are up to next. Our man in Japan, or, or wherever, will give him, will keep him up to speed with what's going on locally. Q will then kit him out with exploding briefcases, remote control BMWs with rocket launchers and, and zip wire belt buckles and those kinds of things. And then when he finally penetrates Blofeld's hollowed out secret underground volcano lair, he has an army of ninjas in brightly covered pyjamas to, to, to come and fight the, the army of henchmen also wearing brightly coloured pyjamas. Bond is only successful because he knows what his mission is. He's given everything that he needs to do it and he's got backup on hand to help him out when he needs it most. Now how do we feel when it comes to our mission? When it comes to evangelism? Are we well briefed? Do we know what we're supposed to be doing? Are we well equipped? Do we feel like we're trained and empowered and confident and, and able to talk to our friends? Are we well supported? Have we got backup to help us when we need it? Well, if you answered no to any or all of those questions, let me tell you that, that you're in good company. Now, several years ago now, um, the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, LICC, um, an organisation that's, that's, that's based in London and seeks to resource Christians in their evangelism and mission, in their workplaces and, and lives. They, they survey churches throughout the UK asking leaders and members those very same questions. And the overriding response that they got back was no to all of them. And actually, as we look at this passage this morning, we'll see that the disciples would answer in exactly the same way too. Look at verse six. They're confused. They're not sure what's going on or what Jesus expects of them now. So this morning, I want you to put yourself in their sandals for a minute. Think of all that they had seen and heard Jesus do and teach in the three years that, that he was with them. They had been right there when he healed the sick, when he cast out demons, when he raised the dead, when he walked on water, when he calmed the storm, when he fed 5,000 plus people. They'd heard him teach unlike no one else they'd ever heard. They'd, they'd seen crowds flock to see him, to hear him, to touch him, to be healed by him. And at the same time, they'd seen the rising tide of opposition and rejection, culminating in him being arrested, beaten, flogged and sentenced to death by a cowardly judge. They had deserted him and fled for their lives whilst he was executed in the most barbaric way human minds have ever conceived. They'd heard the tomb he laid in was empty. 
And then they had seen him risen again from the dead and heard him tell them that he would go away again to heaven, but that it would be for their good. Verses four and five of Acts one. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What did it all mean? What were they to do now? I wonder if you can think back to your first day at school or perhaps uh, your first day at, at a new job. What were you feeling on that first day? What, what were you expecting? Maybe a whole mixture of fear, trepidation, <laughs> excitement, adventure, possibly. Well, maybe we can get some idea of what these guys must have been feeling that day in, in Acts chapter 1. But actually in verse 6, Luke shows us the depths of, of their confusion. Chapter 1, verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In their minds, they, they're, they're still expecting a, a political messiah. Someone who's, who's going to come and rescue them from, from the Romans. Remember the end of, of Luke's gospel, chapter 24. Those two guys walking away from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus, bitterly disappointed. Their hopes crushed as Jesus died on the cross. But as Jesus uh, appeared to them, opened their hearts, opened the scripture. For the first time, they saw who he truly really is and all that he'd came to do and, and how their hearts burned within them as they realised that for the first time. Well, so here. He died, but now he's risen. So in these disciples' minds, maybe now's the time for, for the revolution. We're going to get our kingdom back. Well, Jesus sees their confusion, their uncertainty and their fear. And in verse 7 and 8, he sets things straight for them, speaking to all of those different things. Acts, Acts 1, 7 to 8, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He lets them know what their mission is and how they will be able to go about it. And we're going to focus in on verse 8 for the rest of our time and look at the, the, the what, the where and the how, if you like, of the mission that Jesus gives them. We're going to start off with the how. And our first point is um, the power for our mission, the power for evangelism. James Bond gets, gets flashy gadgets from Q. We get not a thing, but a person, someone who is infinitely greater. It's an amazing promise in verse eight, isn't it? This ragtag bunch of hapless fishermen, scared and confused, Jesus says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Think of how reassuring that must have been to these guys. Jesus is going back to heaven, but, but they're not going to be on their own. The third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, a person, not a thing or some weird sort of Star Wars-y force. God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling in them, empowering them. Well, why is that good news? Why is that important? Well, the massive impossible task they're about to be given in the second half of this verse doesn't depend on their strength, but on his strength. It's, it's hugely encouraging for them. It's hugely encouraging for us. 
But it's an important corrective too. Remember their question in verse 6, they're, they're thinking in political kingdom terms. They're thinking worldly power. Jesus says, you're going to get an altogether different kind of power to that. Well, what are the implications of, of that for them and, and for us by extension? Well, I want us to think about that by asking another question. Here it is. What do you think makes for effective evangelism? What makes for effective evangelism? What makes an evangelism effective? Actually, how we answer that is very revealing of, of what we're trusting in when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to speaking to others um, about Jesus. Where's our hope? That question reveals it. Because here's the thing, evangelism is hard. I probably don't need to tell you that, but, but I've just told you that. <laughs> I've never met a Christian who thinks evangelism is easy. In fact, as soon as you start talking about evangelism, you find the exact opposite. Listen to this quote from uh, Tim Keller, looking at how um, attitudes to Christianity in the West have changed in recent years. This is a, a, an excerpt from um, How to Reach the West again. He says this, while religion was broadly seen as, as a social good, or at least benign, increasing numbers of people now see the church as bad for people and a major obstacle to social progress. Traditional Christian beliefs about sexuality and gender are being viewed as dangerous and restrictive of people's basic civil rights. That's increasingly the case in, in our culture, isn't it? Here's another quote, this time from um, the Barna Group, a, a, a kind of Christian um, research group. They'd uh, done some, uh, some research asking um, Christians about what they, their perceptions and, and things about evangelism. And listen to this, this is really striking. Almost half of practising Christian millennials and 47% agree that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. 47% of practising Christian millennials agree that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs. Wrong. Not, not awkward, not difficult. But wrong. That's quite a significant change, isn't it? And with quotes like that, it is easy to feel intimidated and powerless in, in the face that how can we possibly do evangelism effectively in, in a culture like that? The reality is that all too often feelings of fear and inadequacy hold us back from speaking of Jesus to our friends, to our, to our family. What will they say? What can I say? What if they ask about suffering or COVID or... What do I know about anything anyway? God could never use me. Those sorts of thoughts and feelings can, can hold us back and, and those thoughts and feelings rise up in us all too often because deep down, we think evangelism depends on us. Deep down, we fear this world more than Jesus. Deep down, we think this world has more authority than he does. But what did Jesus say in Matthew 28? In his great commission to the disciples, that in Matthew's account of what we're looking at here in Acts, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, therefore go. And what do we see here in our, our passage? What makes effective evangelism? It's the power of the Spirit. 
the power of the Spirit. And actually what you see unfolding in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit empowering, equipping, enabling and leading his people as they go about their mission. Chapter by chapter, this is increasingly what you see. And remember, this is all in the context where God's people were right on the margins of society. They were powerless. They were foolish from a worldly perspective. In Acts 2, that's where we see the incredible before and after transformation of this ragtag bunch of fishermen. The disciples have locked themselves in a room. They are scared and are and afraid. But as this gift that Jesus promised them comes to them, the room is shaken, the, the wind comes in, tongues of, of fire settle on their heads, and they are transformed by the Spirit as he fills them and as he emboldens them and as he enables them to speak the word of God in a whole bunch of different languages. Actually, I, I, I think that Acts of the Apostles is a terrible name for this book. Um, rather, this is the continuing mission of Jesus by his Spirit through his people. It's a much better title, but not quite as catchy. But here's the thing. We, we desperately need to take this truth on board. It's not about us. It is all about him. Where should our confidence be? Who really has the authority? Back in Oxford, one of the most encouraging stories from our church plant was um, a friend of ours who, who was on the fringes of, of the church. Um, she'd been brought up in a Christian family and at one point in her kind of late teens seemed to be really on fire for God, but had decisively walked away in subsequent years. She'd been on the fringes of things and... Um, and she overheard a bunch of us talking about a book group we were going to do in the summer in place of our normal home groups. Uh, we'd chosen a book to go through. We we're going to go through it in the pub to, to talk about it. And the book was um, Serving Without Sinking by John Hindley. She overheard the conversation and asked if, if she could read it too and, and come along. And we were sort of awkwardly looking at each other saying... I mean, it's not really a book for non-Christians, um, but oh, I mean, if you really wanted to read it and come along, then I guess you could. And secretly, we were thinking this is a bad idea. But little did we know, by his spirit, God was sovereignly, graciously orchestrating things despite us and and he this is this is what he wonderfully used in his grace to help us see the truth of the gospel and the beauty of Jesus for the first time it was such an amazing lesson to me we we can make plans and devise strategies and uh, and they absolutely have their place don't get me wrong but the reality is i've found in my experience we we are just playing catch up with god with what he is doing by his spirit. And that's what you see right through the book of Acts. And it is hugely encouraging, isn't it? So this is the great promise Jesus makes to his confused, bewildered disciples, wondering what's next. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we've thought a bit about the, the how, the power for evangelism. Secondly, let's look at the what and where of evangelism. And let me ask you for a moment, um, maybe turn to whoever you're watching this with, um, or if you're watching it on your own, get a piece of paper out. I want you to think of the negative and positive stereotypes that come into your head when you think about an evangelist. What are the negative stereotypes that come into your head when you, when you, when you picture an evangelist? What comes into your head? The negative and the positive things. Take a second to think about that. Um, maybe you'll, on the negative side of things, you'll think of someone who is pushy. 
and rude, aggressive, arrogant, out of touch with reality, maybe wearing a shiny white suit and telling you to give them lots of money so you can be healed. Um, well, all of those things are terrible things, aren't they? We, we definitely don't want to be like any of those things. And the danger is we, we think, well, I don't want to be like any of those things, so I'm not going to do evangelism. And that could be a barrier that we need to get over in order to get on with it. Now have a think of the positive stereotypes that we might have in our, in our minds. Maybe you think of someone who's dynamic. Maybe you think of an incredibly funny public speaker. Maybe you think of someone who is full of faith and just going for it. Well, here's the thing. We, we, we look at a list like that of those positive things and, and we look at ourselves and we think, that's not me. And so we think, oh, I'm, I'm never going to be like that. And so we think to ourselves, I, I can't do evangelism, so I'm not going to. The reality is we, want, we need to get past those, those misconceptions, those stereotypes, get rid of them. All too often we make evangelism out to be something more complicated than it is. And as we've already thought about, it doesn't depend on us. And sometimes we, we think it, it does depend on us, but it doesn't. So what does Jesus say in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses, Jesus says. Well, that word comes up again and again and again throughout Acts. Witnesses. We're to be witnesses. Just like in, in a court of law, a witness is, is called to tell the truth about what they have seen or heard or experienced. To witness to the truth. And I want us to see this morning that this is something that every Christian can do. What does it mean? Well, it means two things. Firstly, being a Jesus' witness, being a witness to Jesus means telling Jesus' story. Telling Jesus' story. We need to witness to the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. The apostles, in a, in a special sense, um, witnessed his death, and his resurrection. We need to tell Jesus' story. Not some sort of self-help therapeutic platitudes. We need to testify, to witness to the truth that we see in the Bible about who Jesus is. That he is the risen King Jesus who has all authority. That he died that he was raised and that he will come again to judge. What does being a witness to Jesus mean? Well, it, it means firstly telling his story. But secondly, it means telling our story too. Every Christian believer has, has a unique story of, of how it was they came to believe and trust in Jesus. The miracle that he worked in, in your life, in my life, to bring us to him. And actually in, in today's culture, our story of how Jesus saved us is a particularly powerful tool. Because no one can argue with, with our with our story. No one can disprove it. It is what we have witnessed about Jesus and come to trust him. So I would really encourage you on, on the back of this to take some time later today. To write out your story of how Jesus saved you. Think about the before and the after. And what led to you to, uh, trusting in him. Take some time to write it out. If that helps to kind of gather your thoughts. And tell it to someone. 
perhaps have a think about what it is that you love most about Jesus. Have a think about what, what difference he has made to your life or, or how he has changed you. And why not in home groups, week by week over the next few weeks, why not have one person in the group take it in turns to, to tell their story, to tell their Jesus story, if you like. Because the only way talking about Jesus to non-Christians won't feel too weird and awkward is if it's a natural part of, of what we talk about with everyone anyway. So I'd really encourage you to think about your story and, and practice telling it and talking about it. So that's the what of our mission of, of evangelism. The what of evangelism is being a witness to the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done and witnessing about the, the difference he's made in our lives and what he's done in our lives, our experience of him. Well, let's move on to the where, the where of evangelism, the where of, of our mission. And put your feet back in the sandals of these, of these first disciples again. Verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, the city where Jesus had just been executed. Judea, where they'd been rejected. Samaria, the, the enemies of the Jews in, in all kinds of ways, with, with, relation, uh, with racial, historical, religious tensions going back hundreds of years to the ends of the earth. Are you serious, Jesus? Can you, can you imagine what these guys would have been thinking? Their collective jaws must have hit the floor at this point. The scope of what Jesus is calling to them to is just massive, isn't it? Infinitely greater than their tiny and misguided political ambitions that they were thinking about. The whole world. Not just Jews, everyone. Talk about putting them outside of their comfort zones. But just impossible, isn't it? Humanly speaking, if Jesus was asking them to do this in their own strength, it would be utterly impossible. But that's why Jesus started with that great promise, isn't it? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now there's, there's, real, there's kind of contrasting things going on here. I'm so aware, even, even as I say them to you now, there's a profound simplicity about what Jesus is calling us to as individuals and a church. Be my witnesses, Jesus says. But at the same time, there's a, there's a challenge to go way beyond our comfort zones. But as we finish, um, that challenge to go way beyond, well, it forces us to our knees, doesn't it? It drives us to, to prayer. It's way beyond the limits of, of what we are able to do. And as, we, as we, we finish up, I want you to get a piece of paper or a bookmark or something like that, something you can stick in your Bible. And this year, I want you to, to write three names on that of non-Christians in your life, be friends or family or colleagues, or whoever, that you want to commit to praying for this year. Write them on there. And then uh, when, whenever you come to, to open your Bible or to, to pray, commit to praying for those people. Maybe even share them with, with a good Christian friend, someone in your home group or, or someone like that. So you can be praying for, for each other's um, non-Christian friends too. And let's pray for God to, to be working in the hearts of 
of those people on those lists of paper by his spirit. Let's pray for opportunities to, to witness to the truth of who Jesus is, the hope that only he can, can offer. And let's pray that the spirit would work in their hearts. Let's pray that the spirit would work in our hearts, that he would empower us to love them and to witness to them. And let's make prayer for evangelism a staple part of, of all the different meetings and, and things that we do as a church uh, over this next year. And let's do that right now. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for um, the gospel. We want to thank you for the good news that we have about the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the hope that that is, the living hope that the Apostle Peter speaks of, that transformed him. Thank you that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but instead you, sh you, you lavish us with love, with grace, with, with forgiveness. Thank you that in Christ we have everything. I pray that you would help us to grasp more and more how amazing it is that we've been adopted into your family. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us in that great task of witnessing to the truths that we are of the gospel, the truths of who you are, Lord Jesus. We pray that by your spirit, you would empower us and equip us and, and give us hearts full of compassion and love for those around. And we pray that, as, that you would teach us how to pray for, our, for perhaps people in our minds, even right now. Lord, we, we long that more and more people would come to know and love you themselves. We pray that you would help us to keep um, evangelism a priority in, in our own lives and as a church too. And we thank you that it doesn't depend on us, but it's all about you. So we pray that you'd help us to be watchful, thankful, to make the most of opportunities as they come up. Use us for your glory and the extension of your kingdom. Amen. Thank you.